The budget proposal released by the White House in late May makes numerous across-the-board cuts to programs and services vital to the independence of people with disabilities. Bruce Darling is the CEO for the Center for Disability Rights. He's joining us from New York. Bruce, Mr. Darling, thank you so much for joining us, and welcome to First Edition. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to have you. So let's just get into it. And I'm going to actually look to you to help me kind of frame this issue. So the proposed cuts, and this is to areas such as Medicaid, Social Security Disability, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance, and Section 8 housing programs, will dramatically impact the ability of disabled Americans to live independently in the community. Can you talk to us about this, please? Okay, so we're, we're disturbed because fundamentally disabled Americans require all of these supports. So with Medicaid, Medicaid not only just pays for our medications and our medical procedures, but also the services that we need to live in the community, the attendants who help us get in and out of bed or uh, do the activities of daily living, uh, wheelchairs, durable medical equipment, things like ventilators. These are all the things that we need for life and liberty in the community. And then when you uh, dovetail on top of the trillion, nearly trillion dollars of cuts, that are proposed in the Senate bill right now, with the other cuts that are being proposed in the Trump budget, which would impact affordable, accessible, integrated housing and transportation and all of the other services and supports we need. We are concerned that basically what this means is disabled Americans are going to be forced into institutions and die, basically being denied life and liberty, the things that are guaranteed to us as Americans. Now talk to me about the die-in that took place last week. Can you just help us to understand what happened and then talk about it from your perspective? Okay, so what, uh, what we were trying to do was illustrate the fact that disabled Americans basically are going to be taken away um, and into institutions or die. So we thought the best way to do that was for uh, people with disabilities to go to uh, Senator, Senate Majority Leader McConnell's office and get out of our chairs. Uh, I'm not personally a chair user, but have folks get out of their chairs, get on the floor, and basically be dragged out of the building, wow. okay. um, which is what they did. Um, so we, it was a pretty uh, intense action um, because we were not going to leave because our life and liberty is at stake. And what we wanted to do was send a message that Americans don't take kindly to unjust governments that steal life and liberty and oppress their citizens. And that's exactly what the Republicans in the, in, uh, in the administration and in Congress are uh, doing right now. So now if somebody wanted to, I guess, stand up and to, to join this, so do you want them to come and to be on the line with the Center for Disability Rights to be a part of the die-in? Like, how do people help out with this? How do you get involved? Okay, so a um, uh, starting point is adapt.org, www.adapt.org. We have information posted on sit-ins and die-ins and other protests that are being uh, set up around the country as we speak. So today we had uh, actions in uh, Georgia, in Atlanta, in Philadelphia, Indianapolis, and El Paso. Um, those are ones that I'm aware of. And folks were, uh, with disabilities were dragged out of the offices of the Republican, um, the, of the GOP offices in El Paso. Folks were removed from Senator Young's office in Indianapolis. And um, there were similar issues in uh, Toomey's, Senator Toomey's office in Philadelphia. But basically, we're, we're taking the fight from D.C. out into the the communities where we are. And if folks want to join us, we appreciate allies joining us, um, and they can get information on those actions at www.adapt.org. Now, this is interesting because when people think Diane, because I just kind of polled a couple of people, and when they think Diane, they automatically thought about Black Lives Matter and the use of the Diane as an effective strategizing tool. Has Diane, or this notion of Diane, always been a strategy for the Center for Disability Rights? Is it a new strategy? What did you do before? 
Okay, so well, uh, for, for the record, people with disabilities, when, when we get out of our chairs or when folks who use wheelchairs get out of their chairs and go to the ground, it's an intense physical experience for them and for everyone around them, and it actually creates havoc in terms of uh, dealing with us by the authorities. So we have used this strategy a number mm. of different places. Um, the disability community overall has. So um, in this case, though, Framing it as a die-in was intentional because these cuts will kill people with disabilities. And, you know, this isn't exaggeration. If people don't have the attendant services they need, they will simply go without care, they will get pressure sores, they will have complications, and then they die. We see this now with the system as it is, and we're just trying to draw attention to it so, pe- so America understands this is an attack literally on our lives and our liberty and that, you know, this is just unacceptable. Now, what I think is interesting is that I go into spaces that don't seem to be accessible. So when you confront that, do you start kind of doing a protest against those spaces? Do you do letters? Like, why is this so hard for businesses, for universities to understand that it has to be accessible for everyone? The space must be open. Well, and I think that's one of the things. Well, we typically do a different type of protest. Sometimes when a place is not accessible, we will uh, block entrances or... Um, sometimes with like a restaurant that has a one step that should be accessible, we might set up a table outside, order a pizza, and put up, hold up signs that indicate that this restaurant discriminates against people with disabilities. ADAPT is a grassroots activist group from across the country, and so we do these types of things in our chapters locally all the time. Our El Paso folks who were just uh, dragged out of the GOP offices today actually have had a number of campaigns Um, in their city to make it more accessible. But it's clear that unless we actually take action and do this, uh, do this ourselves, it's not going to happen. Now, I was looking at your website, the Center for Disability Rights, uh, Integration, Independence, Civil Rights, and something immediately came up around this notion of assisted suicide being dead wrong. Can you talk a bit about this? Okay, so a lot of progressives think about assisted suicide as an option. What we see is that people with disabilities whose lives are generally devalued by everyone else who doesn't live with disability are being denied suicide prevention services. So that if um, a non-disabled person says they want to kill themselves, um, the medical professionals and everyone basically says, no, no, you don't want to do that, and basically they intercede. A person with a significant disability says they want to kill themselves. And everyone just basically says, oh, yeah, I wouldn't want to live like that. Mm. I would rather be dead. How can we make that happen for you? Wow. And they tend not to look past the things that are going on in an individual's life. So, like, one of the main cases about uh, assisted suicide, the earliest cases, was a woman who had had a miscarriage, was going through a divorce, was kicked out of graduate school. She had a lot of stuff going on in her life that was complicated and terrible. And when she said she wanted to be starved to death, um, basically, they all said, you have cerebral palsy. I'd want to, I'd want to be dead, too. So wow. let's, make, let's help you with that. Wow. Now, let me think also out loud about this notion of the language that we use, the words that we use to talk about people who are physically challenged. And, and some, one person just texted me, saying, you know, what, what, what is the right language to use? I understand that. Is it people with physical disabilities who are physically challenged? Just because people feel like they're not saying the right thing and they want to. Okay, so at the, for me, at the end of the day, the most important thing is that you're listening to the individual. We have, so you almost can never go wrong with people with disabilities. Okay. Um, but there's a growing um, conversation because, honestly, people used to say things um, that were really offensive and oh, disabled yeah. was seen as a wildly offensive approach. But there is a new uh, resurgence within our community about identity-first language. Mm-hmm. So there's uh, folks who are autistic prefer to say, I'm autistic, because you can't separate the disability from the person, and they don't want to say, you know, I am uh, a person with a disability. It can kind of get a little weird when you say, um, like you wouldn't say, I'm a person with Judaism. Right. No, I mean, I'm thinking really seriously about what you're saying, um, because as an African-American, there's always been this tension around language. You know, do we go, we say African-American, black, Negro, color. Like if you think about the history involved in naming, I would never say, oh, I'm a person who is also black or I'm a person who is black. It starts with black as the first part of my identity. So I, I 
I like that notion of identity first language. It's just when others tend to name you. That's when it gets more complicated. Right, and I, it, it gets complicated sometimes. So I think you're safe now with people with disabilities. Know that there are people who are proud of being people with disabilities and they're going to use identity first language. And that, that, that they may say, no, I'm a disabled person or I'm autistic. And they may, they may correct you. And in that case, Pay attention, take your lead from the individual with the disability and do what they're asking. Because um, honestly, I think it's exciting. We're learning from other movements about how language has pride and how some of the language around um, person first language has contributed to ableism and people seeing us as less than people because, you know, we have, we had initially assert that we were people. Right. Now we're trying to assert that we have pride in who we are. I like that. I'm just making some notes here. I have a question uh, to just kind of follow up and really flush out this vision and mission uh, for the Center for Disability Rights. Um, It says here, a society in which people with disabilities enjoy full integration, independence, and civil rights. I understand the language, but what does that look like, actually? What does that mean? Well, like, right now, disabled people can be locked up in institutions, having done nothing wrong, they get locked up in institutions and nursing facilities. People think they're taking care of us, but what they're doing is taking away our freedom. Um, they, we can be denied um, access to buildings. We can be um, basically tortured with treatment that we don't want, um, killed through assisted suicide because basically you're having a bad day or you know, you're going right. through a difficult period. What we see is a world where people actually, we have full access and opportunity just like everyone else, where the services and supports we need to be uh, to live our lives are provided to us, where we can actually have something, have opportunities for employment. Like right now, over 60% of people with disabilities are not in the workforce. It's not because we're lazy or we lack skills or what have you. It's because the ableist world doesn't give us those opportunities. So having the opportunity to live the American dream, to get education, have a career, have a family, have a life, have a home, this is what we're looking for, and and that's how we would define the, 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 that's the goal of what we're doing with our mission. If you're just joining us, you're listening to First Edition on WEA 88.9 FM. I'm Dr. K, sitting in for Sean Yost. I'm talking with Bruce Darling. He's a CEO for the Center for Disability Rights, and we're now going to review the federal fiscal year 2018 budget that will affect those with disabilities. So how much is Trump talking about cutting from the budget? It's a massive amount of money is being cut. I can't actually tell you the exact amount because it just decimates so many different pieces of things that we're doing. One of the things that's a big issue for us um, is the impact on um, what's called um, the independent living funding, Mm -hmm. the independent living services that we provide. The Centers for Independent Living, which CDR is one, is the only disability-led, that means organizations run by people with disabilities, uh, network that exists in the country. Um, we have these propo- we have funds within um, the federal budget that support these centers, and those funds were basically zeroed out. So they thought they acted like this was sort of. And we have councils at the state level that plan what to do with that. Here in New York, we did some amazing things in terms of transitioning folks into the community, um, providing technical assistance so that could happen. Um, amazing project. But all of that's going to, and work that we're doing through centers in terms of peer support where people with disabilities help other people with disabilities uh, live in the community and be integrated, all that's just going to go away in this federal, this proposed federal budget. Now, I just want to go back and, and think through this notion of what you said, the ableist world, because somebody sent me a quick tweet just wanting you to kind of talk more about that. Is it in terms of the ableist world that the world is set up, obviously, I mean, this should be understood by people, it's set up for able-bodied individuals. That if that if Does that mean people who are, are not in a wheelchair, people who can see, people who can hear and can move freely through? So if that is the case, what are some ways to confront this ableist mind? Is it through media? Is it through, you know, having more books? I mean, like, what can we do to confront this? Not just with the laws, of course, which are important, but with the ways in which people then see people who are physically challenged or physic- people with disabilities. So I, I think it's a, a similar ways we address, we address all the isms out there and all the discrimination. Yeah. It's helping promote the voices of people with disabilities. And for us, it's really important that our allies allow us to speak for ourselves. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's amazing um, like, no, like for us, having organizations that are run by people with disabilities, they're very different from the organizations that want to fix us right. and change <laughs> us. 
Um, and I tell people if the National Organization for Women were run by a group oh, of word, men, yes. oh, it would probably be a very different organization. Um, the fact that most non-disabled people don't understand that until you point it out around disability organizations, and even then they're like, well, are there disabled people who can do this? You know, all of that just un- underscores the attitudes around people with disabilities and it's not even necessarily an intentional negative bad thing that's intended. It's just how we've been taught. Um, basically, people are seen, we're seen as less than, less able. We need to be protected and taken care of. And we're trying to change that dynamic so that we can be actual equal citizens and participating citizens in society. Now, if people wanted to, when you say act as allies, I'm thinking about um, this notion of coming in. You said joining in, going to the website, being a part of it, perhaps writing letters. But I tend to think about people trying to confront that ableist mind in themselves, right? That the ways in which we change these things is that people have to first recognize that this ableism rests inside of you, that you have to confront. I mean, it's it's the hard work that we do to get past isms that tend to make us short-sighted in so many ways. Exactly. And it, it may be, okay, so, and I understand People may be uncomfortable about this. Right. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> I mean, be uncomfortable. I mean, some of what we're trying to do is help people understand that. And I think intersectionally, we're trying to work and, and, and address it across down, you know, across communities. So, as a queer man who works within the disability community, um, who's a disabled man himself, so a queer disabled. I mean, I shouldn't have to be forced to choose between my identities. And honestly, there is a disconnect in the LGBTQ community about people with disabilities. There's a focus on physical beauty, physical ability. Mm, okay. And they're not accessible. And I understand why that is. For years, um, queer folks have needed to have space that was safe, meaning not accessible. You couldn't get to it easily because there was physical danger. Well, that's evolved into barriers that prevent queer folks with disabilities from being engaged in the community. So we need to sort of understand what our own biases are. If seeing people with significant disabilities, it makes you uncomfortable. Recognize that that's an ableist thing that you've been taught, and that's not how it is, and that people with significant disabilities can live in the community and be integrated. So, uh, for me, I think it's amazing that people question, well, is that person really able to live in the community? Well, actually, yes. There is no threshold that says you're too disabled. There should right. be no threshold. This is your two disabled. There shouldn't be a litmus test for freedom. I, you know, Brad Williams, executive director of New York State Independent Living Council, wanted to be with us tonight. He couldn't make it. Um, but we do have some of his statements, and I wanted to just kind of share them and, and hear some feedback from you about that. Uh, he notes that it, this new bill, this uh, passage of the American with Disabilities Act in 1990, which is not new, but he said what Trump is doing is going against that, that what Trump is doing is failing to recognize that investing in people with disability also supports the economy. Independent living allows more people to work as taxpaying citizens and become productive members of society. Because some individuals need additional support from direct care workers and organizations, people with disabilities also add valued jobs to the community. How do we help people to understand and see this as a reality? And how do we help our president to see this? Oh, God. Um, how do we help our president? That's a big question. <laughs> That's going to take all night to figure that one out, I tell yeah, you. Yeah, no, honestly, I think, um, I think it's by banding together. Personally, um, I believe that, um, well, I believe the world is on the, on the right path. I think that this is a blip. Um, the pendulum will swing back the other direction, but we have to all work together and push like hell uh, to make sure that it moves back in the right direction where we understand concepts of justice and we support each other and we actually treat each other the way we need to be uh, treated. Um, so getting this president to understand that, I'm not exactly sure I can make the case, but I um, understand how to do that. But in terms of public protest, being loud, pushing back, pushing hard. I mean, one of the things that we did when we were pulled out of McConnell's office and, you know, dragged out, we did, we, we, it needs to be more than a press conference. Right. This idea that we're going to have press conferences and that's going to change the world, 
I don't think so. We need to actually have direct action. Be in the streets, be in their offices, be in their faces. Now, I just wonder, uh, because you know, we, we are talking about this new age that we're living in. I mean, some people have called it the Trumpian age. I wouldn't give him that much credit and name a new age or an era after him, because it really is just a blip in this long continuum. But do you think with the ways that President Trump, during his campaign, mocked uh, people with disabilities, you know, along with his mocking of women and then people of color, if that opened up another door that people felt comfortable going forward? with their own attitudes towards people that he mocked. Absolutely, and I think that's the thing that's sickened me through this process. Um, I was, um, I don't know, I thought, the, I was excited. Black Lives Matter actually pushed people to see the world in a different way. Um, it pushed, you know, people who had white privilege to actually recognize some of them anyway. It was bad stuff happening. And I saw us beginning to pull together as a more collective, progressive community. Um, this is a blip, um, it does, but it does disturb me because, honestly, it's hate. Um, and that's just not the kind of person I am. That's not the kind of world I want to be. And I think one of the things about the fight that's going on now that we're getting a lot of response from folks saying, this is genocide, this reminds me of Nazi Germany, this is yeah. terrible. And what, what I'm hopeful is that the disability community can potentially be the point of the sphere where people realize this kind of divisiveness is not the kind of country we want to live in. And let's extend that out to all of the oppressed communities so that we are not, you know, treated this way and that we change the dynamics so that people can say, hey, you know what, we're all working together, we're all humans, we need to be supportive of each other and have a different, di- a different dynamic. Kate's business has got to stop. Now, do you think that some of the ways that this can be done is to have more dialogue? I mean, I know that that protest is important. You know, I'm a firm believer in protest. I think, you know, being dragged out is important. I even think, you know, what you were talking about, the intense physical condition for a person who is in a wheelchair to actually pull themselves up and get down on the floor and then be dragged out. That is intense for people watching it, people participating in it, uh, taking part in this. But what about this, this notion of more open dialogue? Is that even in this particular statement? In this particular environment, is dialogue even an option anymore? Okay, I think for a lot of these folks, dialogue, it, it, the policymakers, the Republicans in control, I don't think dialogue is an option with them right now. Okay. I think they've got their mindset on taking money from the poor, giving it to the rich so they can get campaign donations. However, dialogue among all the rest of us, I think, is an incredible opportunity. This creates an incredible opportunity for us to talk openly about these issues and decide what kind of country we want to live in. And I think we can begin to extend out and understand, you know, that oppression of a group of people is not right, whether it's oppression based on race, disability, sexual orientation, gender identity. And these are all things that that's the diversity of America. That's what makes us great. And we just need to have, I think we need to have a conversation about that. And I'm hopeful that this push and this fight over where the money goes can open that door to that conversation. Yeah, because money seems to be what's driving so much of this. I think the thing that you just said that is most disturbing um, is that dialogue won't help those that are in power and those that are in power are not open to dialogue. So if you are changing things on the ground, I agree with that. But the notion that the people who have the power are not even interested in listening and those of us who have power, because I do believe there's something around collective power, right? Around protest, exactly. around voting, that there's, I think people forget that we do have the power to change them. When we get in that voting booth, we have the power to pull the lever in a different way. Making people exactly. feel empowered that they can do that. I think these are why we need to have these conversations. Are there conversations going on now? We only have a few more minutes, but I want to help people plug in. Like, I want them to hear this conversation and then say, I want to do something. I want to, A, confront the ableism in my own heart, right? Because pe- people don't even really think about what that looks like. We we talk a lot about racism or sexism or classism. We don't talk a lot about ableism, right? That's not part of the isms that are talked about. So do you are you hosting conversations? I know people can go to your website. I want you to give that again, but where can people begin to do this hard work? Okay, so I think uh, learning about um, ableism is an important part of that. So there's some, some great folks online. Um, the Harriet, uh, look up the Harriet Tubman collect, Collective. Oh, yeah. Um, Ramp Your Voice. 
these are uh, these are great resources that talk about ableism and it can and help people understand it. Um, okay, and, and recognize it's okay to be uncomfortable when you're looking at this stuff and thinking, "Wow, I am uncomfortable when I see someone in the, with a disability. Wow, I wouldn't want to live like that." I, what I want people to know is, if you acquire a disability, there is hope, there is life, and you're the same person. Your fear of what it means to be disabled is far worse than the actual experience. Um, and listen to folks who have gone to the other, who have experienced disability, who live with disability, and listen to those voices of pride that, that we have um, in, 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 and, um, in terms of understanding it. Let me also ask in the last few seconds that we have available, we just had uh, a, a tweet coming in uh, from Karen, and she was just interested in finding out more about the deaf community. I'm just going to try to see if I can truncate her long question that came across in a, a series of tweets. But she was just wondering if it is true, in fact, that the deaf community has a separate community, and if, if that's even an answer to kind of separate the communities out. So there, the the disability community is as diverse as the LGBTQ community. Okay. There are so many of us in so many sub communities. This, the disability community, though, is an overarching community that includes the deaf community. When we're doing activism, like when we were in McConnell's office, there were individuals who were deaf, blind, wheelchair users, uh, people with non visible disabilities, either psychiatric, cognitive, however folks want to define those. So there's a whole broad range of people with disabilities, and we are collect that way. Um, so the deaf community is very much a part of the disability community. Our Center for Independent Living in Rochester is actually the largest employ- non-educational employer of deaf folks in Rochester, which has the largest concentration of deaf people per capita in the country. So we're very much a, a, a collective community. Oh. There are some elements where folks are, where deaf folks are saying it's a more of a communication issue, but um, we are still really overall is in terms of leadership, people may be fearful of identifying as disabled, um, even deaf folks, but there are, but that's all just internalized ableism, and we're working to address that. Thank you so much. Bruce Darling is the CEO for the Center for Disability Rights. Thank you for joining us and for helping us to confront and think about these issues.